So, is Barry Bonds a Hall of Famer? Yeah. So welcome. This is the final episode. We've been talking for over a month now about the life and career of Barry Lamar Bonds. And today we're going to be asking the question that's been on our and everyone else's minds watching at home. Is Barry Bonds deserving of a spot in Cooperstown? Yeah, you have to think about the, the way to word it because this is like we talked about, this is the most complicated baseball player that has ever lived. We're here for that reason. It, on paper, it should not even be a question that we're asking if Barry Bonds is a Hall of Famer, but there are a myriad of reasons why someone could hold that status away from him, and it's kind of impossible not to touch on them. So that's that's what we're here to do, is we have a big final discussion, all things legacy, all things post-playing career, with obviously the pinnacle being our stance on his, you know, being kept out of the Hall of Fame officially, for the entire length of his runtime on the ballot. There's a lot of complicated things, like you said, that are holding essentially his Hall of Fame candidacy hostage at this point. So I think it's best to start with something that we talked about last episode and building off of that, which is the whole steroid debate. In 2003, news drops publicly that Barry, that links Barry Bonds to steroids, and it turns into a big legal fight between Barry Bonds and the United States government, also the California government, and involves a company that we refer to as Balco. Do you want to start and set the scene there so we can lay the groundwork for the rest of the discussion? Yeah, so all you really need to know about the Balco scandal is that that's what kind of shifted public perception on steroids. Now that was, you know, being prosecuted practically. So that's kind of the switch being flipped of when baseball people started to, you know, hold that as a weapon against people's candidacies and legitimacy for the Hall of Fame. That's when like you got a lot, lot more of suspensions, that kind of thing. Because now, you know, the government's getting involved. It got very serious. The Wild Wild West was over with performance enhancing drugs. And that's kind of the start of when the public was like, hey, when Barry Bonds came back a lot bigger and more muscular, hey, the, the open secret is no longer a secret. It's, yeah, this guy was probably pumping himself full of stuff that we don't normally get the average people and is not necessarily legal and this was very much a big change for the history of major league baseball i mean at this point there was no mandatory testing in the league for steroids after this point of course commissioner selig had implemented rules league-wide that would affect uh, all players moving forward so this was very much a big transitionary time for major league baseball this was all over the news this wasn't just limited to the scope of the sport or sports in general this was very much becoming like a you want to see it on these on these new news outlets and um it definitely very much became uh, a national um, news story so barry bonds was indicted uh, meaning he was called to appear in front of a grand jury to testify against Balco, which is a company that was distributing anabolic steroids to professional athletes. This extended to um, Olympic athletes and also several players in Major League Baseball, including Bonds himself. So uh, Barry Bonds was indicted. He had to appear in front of a grand jury and he essentially testified under oath that he did not willingly take performance enhancing drugs. He had said, he had said that he was given something called flaxseed oil and arthritis bomb that he did not know would actually be a performance enhancing drug and that would actually cause some complications later on when he is accused of lying under oath for those that don't know that's called perjury it's a very serious offense and he then has to appear in court again a few years down the line for quote unquote perjuring himself at that point because he was accused of knowingly and willingly taking performance enhancing drugs so that's an entirely different case and he's at first found guilty of it, and then appellate court kind of throws it out later on. They can't come to an unanimous verdict. So I don't want to say he gets off on it because we don't really know all the details. It's a very complicated situation, but legally, Barry Bonds did not commit perjury. It's still just like something that's attached to his name as are multiple allegations of domestic violence from various partners of his life. Not something he's ever been prosecuted for but it's been reported numerous times by multiple partners so to put simply it's bad and it's complicated and this is a person who's made a lot of poor decisions in his life 
doing a lot of things that the average person should not and hopefully will not ever do. And when you put all that together, you got a guy that you really can't, you know, comfortably put your heart behind. It's hard to find the words for this sort of thing, but I think the easiest way to go about it is to say that Barry Bonds was not necessarily, it, it harks back to what we were talking about earlier. Barry Bonds was kind of a jerk. He did jerk things. And it's really just a question of if these jerk things that are, are they enough to kind of bar everything that we saw on a baseball field? That's really the big debate we're having. Steroids is, you know, a big, the biggest, you know, piece of that pie, but it's made all the more complex and layered by all these other off the field issues. And the fact that we're here and it's this complicated speaks to both the incredible nature of his on field and the numerous amounts of bad things off the field, regardless of if you want to say he's a bad person, he absolutely did a lot of less than good things. And just for the sake of truth, let's be clear of that. Just to be transparent, because I think it's important. The domestic violence allegations, I did not know about till about six hours ago. I had done essentially all of my research for this episode this morning. So just for the sake of being transparent, I really haven't had enough time to let these things sink in and to form an opinion. I mean, I haven't even had half a day yet. So I do want to come back around to this when we get really into the Hall of Fame candidacy discussion, because there are some important points that I would like to make and establish. And I think it's important that we take those things seriously and talk about them. But if you're good to go, I think we can really get into the, essentially the final debate of this entire series. Is Barry Bonds qualified to be in Cooperstown? Should he be a member of the National Baseball Hall of Fame? And I think there are a few different routes that I'd like to take with answering that question, but I'd first like to defer to you to see if you maybe want to start with your opinion on it. I don't yet. I do want to be very clear that we are condemning a lot of what happened off the field and to an extent on it uh, for to some degree. I know that like if you're going to wield legal cases at people, they better be convicted, which Bonds technically was not for pretty much any of this. This really is court of public opinion and just two guys raw thoughts on assessing it. It you can you can take that at face value and some people really didn't for a while for a lot of this like he wasn't technically punished for a lot of it he even got another job in baseball which is what i want to talk about first that's kind of soonest on the timeline Mm -hmm. i want to talk about when he was the hitting coach for the marlins because that's a kind of a funny job to have in hindsight especially for barry bonds and it was one year And depending on who you ask, it was either really awesome or really awful. So I want to ask you if you have any memory of that. It was that 2016 Marlins season where their, you know, hitting mentor guru guy was Perry Bonds. It's funny, thinking back before this episode, I vaguely, and I mean vaguely, remember seeing his face pop up whenever the the Mets, the team that I watch, would play them. And I'd be like, I know this guy. Who is he? And now here I am talking about him in a a five episode series. Um, But as far as memories, the only things I really remember are the um, offensive seasons of guys like Giancarlo Stanton, who hit 59 home runs, who we referenced last episode, won the National League MVP. Um, Christian Yelich had a great year. Justin Bohr had a nice season. Um, There were a couple of guys on that team that were actually really good. So when I had found out researching for this episode that Barry Bonds was fired after one season, I was actually a little surprised because it seemed like a lot of guys had pretty decent seasons. I think only one guy, I think D. Gordon, might have had a below average OPS plus, and a good number of guys put up some good numbers. But as the team collectively, they got a little bit better, but they still were not very good at hitting the ball. So maybe you can shed some light, maybe why that is, or maybe just some extra fun stuff about that season that I might be missing. Sure. So. Funny you mentioned D. Gordon, because the the year Barry Bonds was their hitting coach was the year he got popped for PEDs. Just a little coincidence there. Mm. Uh, But David Sampson, former Marlins executive, not a person that is universally liked in the baseball community, but he was Barry Bonds' boss, for lack of a better term here, likes to go on and say that it was a disaster when he was there. Kind of for every reason we would talk about everything else, that he had a bit of an abrasive personality kind of walked around like he owned the place in a negative light 
he said David Sampson was like, the interview process was a disaster, accused him of not really doing anything. But if you ask, say, Christian Yelich, Christian Yelich will say, yeah, he taught me a drill that really helped me, and then I won an MVP and finished runner-up the next year after I left Miami. So, like everything else with Barry Bonds, it is stupidly complicated, and no one really knows what to feel or what's the truth for a lot of it. It's just another funny example of how it falls onto the same branch of the same tree with his hitting coach tenure can't even go smoothly and without controversy and it's there's still even stories about how good he was as a hitter there's rumors that he would do you know like a home run derby with Stanton and Yelich and win and he's like a fossil by then he's like this shouldn't be happening why are we having so much drama and stakes and complex narratives in Barry Bonds being a hitting coach for one season on a team that went under 500. And it wasn't even the Giants. Was there, just being in the same clubhouse as him at that time in 1998, I think he was a little bit above 400 home runs at the time. Mm -hmm. Incredible slash line. Everyone knew he was one of the best players in the game. Was there a certain type of a presence with him? Like, when he walked into a room, was it just... Was it just different when he walked in? Like, what was kind of the aura around Bonds at the time, you know, personally as someone yeah. that played with him? I think as a, from a, a fan's perspective, yes, you would probably think that way. But from a teammate's perspective, no. He was just one of the guys, you know, he did things a lot. It seemed like he made it look a lot easier at times. You know, he could tell you as a hitting coach, he could be one of the best hitting coaches out there because he could look at your swing analyze it tell you exactly what's moving what's not moving and what's supposed to move at any given point he was one of the best i was struggling one day and he got behind me behind the screen at home plate and he told me he says hey scoot up one inch scoot your back foot up one inch your your front side is open slightly close that front side and keep that same approach and i guarantee you you'll be successful tonight two home runs that night doing it that way i mean the guy he was amazing at what he did and for him to go out on a daily basis not only be successful against right handers but also lefties at any point starters middle relievers closers it didn't matter with barry and and that's why i always considered him the best player that i ever played with in the game and i played with a lot of great players well speaking of the giants give me one second i'll, I'll go back to them um it's funny that you mentioned the home run derby stuff because it really just goes to show this was what 2015 2016 you said 16 16 is so this was long. nine years after barry bonds's last season remember he gets blacklisted from major league baseball in 2008 he very much as we said last time could have had a job at that point if he's still competing with the national league mvp i like that you bring up the black ball because look at where we're at nine years after he was not given a shot because they thought the baggage was too much to you know have him be probably your best hitter on your team for the league minimum in 2008 and by 2016 a team is like yeah we'll pay you to you know mentor and work with our hitters and whether it worked is the jury's still out and i wish i didn't just say the jury's still out and we're talking about barry bonds that's a really poor choice of words on my part i didn't even realize the connection there but yeah and it's funny that it's the Marlins, too, a team that he technically had nothing to do with. You would think the Giants are the team that brings it back in, like how when Kansas City had George Brett as a temporary hitting coach, for example. You would think that if the seal is to be lifted, it is in San Francisco. But San Francisco has been almost the opposite of how they were when Barry Bonds was there for two reasons. One, they have three championships since Barry Bonds left. And two, every single year since he's left, they have had a different opening day left fielder. So both the wow. consistency of having him there and the lack of, you know, getting a trophy are both out the window, practically the second that he left San Francisco, which is funny considering it was those two things were staples. Barry Bonds is the Giants left fielder. Giants don't win championships. Both of those things have been torn to shreds. Before Why I make- is it so complicated to talk about Barry Bonds? Before I make one correction to what you just said, I think... I just two things that I missed last episode. It's kind of crazy to imagine a world where Barry Bonds was on the same team as Matt Cain and Travis Ishikawa. He was on the team for one season, and Bruce Bochy managed that team. It's just a little hard to put that into perspective. I think um, Tim Winsicum's on the 07 Giants, too. That I didn't know. Was it his rookie season, probably? I think 
he was drafted in 05 or 06, so I'll, it's definitely his rookie season, Tim Winsicum. But I know because 08 is his Cy Young year, the first one, and he is not a rookie that year. So mm-hmm. Winsicum is on the 07 Giants. It's just a matter of if he's drafted. I think he actually might be drafted in 06. He came up pretty quick. It's hard to imagine that all this stuff that we've been talking about for the last month has been somewhat recent, especially obviously in the last episode as far as timeline's concerned. Um, but the one correction I wanted to make was that the Giants were actually the first team that brought him back in any kind of a role. And I don't know Ooh, if... Really? Yeah, so they actually, in March of 2014, they had a seven-day stint with him as a training instructor uh, at spring training. So it was brief. It was seven days. It was temporary. But just to add a minor correction, the Giants were actually the first team that brought him back. Okay, and- I, I'm more. I guess I meant like brought him back fully and like yeah. paid him to be a team employee mm-hmm. i think that it's a little bit of a one toe in one toe out situation when you're a guest spring training guy i almost mm-hmm. don't want to count that because a lot of teams do that with a lot of guys like speaking your language the mets have done that with david wright and mike piazza and those guys they're not coaches they're yeah. not paid team employees spring training is typically a time especially for organizations with plenty of guys to pick from that come back and kind of do their work with guys like david wright was helping Brett Beatty and Mark Vientos this past spring with the Mets just to, you know, keep it with when you said they're the team you watch. So just keeping it in that neighborhood, it's definitely it fits that he does that for the Giants. I would love to see him do it for the Pirates sometime. Mm -hmm. But considering that the Giants are not the team that makes him the full time hitting coach is still a little, I guess, weird is the word I want to use. It's funny because you would never associate Barry Bonds wearing the 2012 to 2018 Marlins uniform with like, Mm. you know, I guess they keep the orange, but it is still like Barry Bonds is there at the Fort Bragg game, which is something that is like an overlap I never thought I'd have. He's on that Marlins team where Jose Fernandez passed away, which is just feels like two completely different corners of baseball history. But hey, game is the game and he's always found a way to stick around in it even when he's basically exiled from it. Surprisingly enough, kind of tying into that point before that I was kind of surprised that Bonds was let go after one season. The team did finish fourth in batting average, had the sixth lowest strikeout rate in baseball. Um, They did hit the second fewest homers. They did not slug much outside of Giancarlo Stanton and Justin Bohr. Uh, As far as Team WRC+, Plus, they were 20th. So there were minor improvements, but this team still as a whole, as a collective, was not scoring runs. And I would assume that that's the main reason why they let him go. I don't know if there have been any rumors since then saying anything else as far as maybe something that uh, Samson might have felt when he was, he said, VP of the Marlins at the time. Samson thinks he's a jerk. Samson thinks that Barry Bonds is not necessarily easy, which doesn't excuse, like you said, the, the stats, even though... I've seen Yelich vouch very heavily for him teaching him some stuff. So the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. We, I think and also at the same time, both things can exist. He could probably help a guy or two learn something along the way. And mm-hmm. David Sampson can feel he is a abrasive, not really worth it, not even that great at his job kind of guy. Both of those things can probably be true. But that's really all I got. I just wanted to touch on it. But we, when you're ready, I'm willing to kind of have, you know, the big one, the one we're waiting on here. But... I do also want to lump in that all this is about legacy, what we've talked about. We did want to bring on a voice of the current generation in baseball, one of the fastest growing baseball creators on YouTube and TikTok, a guy named Dan Sarmiento, a friend of mine, who has kind of done a really good job at capturing what baseball is like for high school and early college kids. So we want to pick his brain about all things, how today's generation he feels sees Barry Bonds. The reason why I thought you'd be perfect to get on and talk about, you know, Barry Bonds' legacy, I remember I saw you did a poll on the community tab of your YouTube channel uh, of who is the best player of all time. And Barry Bonds won by a huge margin. Can you speak on that? Were you expecting that? Were you expecting your audience to say that? Fill us in there. You know, it's interesting because there's like been a, even though most of my audience probably never, definitely never saw Bonds play or have any idea of like the cultural impact he had at the time, they still know because of the ripple effects of it. And I think even his steroid use like makes that explode even more because it becomes, it's like multiple storylines that kind of surpass generations. So yeah, it's kind of crazy. To, and then there's like highlights and stuff, but people really don't understand it. But even as me, someone who, never watched him play in person. I just understand the impact he had because social media has kind of revived all those old clips that are in the vault and stuff. And so, yeah, I kind of, I expected Bonds to win like the poll that I did, but um, yeah, like he kind of crushed it. Like 
every, every there was pretty much either like there was like 90 that were like bonds no question and then like 10 percent were like oh you steroids but are still like but yeah he is the best how would you say that it's even possible that you said you've never seen him you don't think your audience ever saw him play like with you know your own two eyes and it's still overwhelmingly possible like how do you think that could be yeah, I think it just speaks to like his pure dominance. Like he just was so good for a long period of time. And I think it just kind of transcends generations the same way like Babe Ruth is is still talked about as like the goat or one of the goats, even though I don't think I couldn't name one of like his career stats in the top of my head. I just know that he had like some he was way better than anyone else at the same at the time he played and Bonds just kind of has that same like, oh, this dude was like he's like Michael Jordan. It's like, oh, this he was the guy. So we remember him as the guy of that time just kind of transcends through like even 10 year olds know that bonds is, is the goat as somebody who hasn't seen bonds play before who would a comp be somebody who you have seen at least somebody who you don't think knowing bonds like just stats wise and his legacy somebody who like in your head you'd even put in that same echelon just to get like a i guess a an idea of someone we can compare to in the modern era I'd have to go like seasons at a time. So like Aaron Judge's last season, last year, like obviously extremely dominant. I think his 2017 year, same thing. He was just like leagues above everyone else. He was making highlights every single day. People would see him. And then it became like a thing like, oh, how many home runs is he going to hit? It becomes like, like multiple storylines throughout the season. I even think like, you look at like Josh Hamilton, 2012, just like seasons that stand out that are like, oh my God, like he had, so he was so on that year. That felt, for me, not knowing yeah. Bonds' stats top of my head, that seems like what it was for Bond, like a 10-year stretch instead of just one season at a time. Yeah. He had the 73 home run year. Uh, he had the all-time OPS plus in a season record on base percentage. These are all three different seasons uh, that he did all these different things. How much do you wish you were, like, there for that to experience it, like, just even being a fan of baseball? Well, dude, here's the thing. Like, I, it, when you see someone that dominant, it's like, you just you as it's happening you start to realize i feel like it'll start off like oh he's doing really well and kind of like judge this year but then you start realizing like oh i'm kind of witnessing history right now like this is kind of crazy so like the only comparison i have it to have to it is like judge and then i even think of like basketball like lebron's had a few seasons like that where it's like oh my god he's playing so well like it doesn't even it doesn't even make sense steph curry that one yeah oh, every year but he's just like making high, every single day is like another storyline another highlight that he's, he's he's made that you thought was, couldn't even comprehend as possible that's so I, I wish i saw bonds in person because i would have been able to be like oh like you, you remember those things like oh i feel like i am witnessing history right now i should like sit still and pay attention it kind of just like grabs it just kind of you get tunnel vision on like oh what's going on right here i gotta pay attention to this uh and that's a pretty special thing i feel like you only get that a few times every decade in sports so as a baseball fan it would have been awesome to see it but i think you know in my eyes at least he has had, had those years so we can compare it to what's going on nowadays so like i say judge judges 2022 campaign oh, okay it was like bonds's four-year stretch except he did in one year but it was four years straight whatever so it's like at least i can give it some sort of relevance and comparison in my head um so like it, it's not like when people have insane seasons it's not like the first time anyone's ever hit 65 plus home runs because bonds hit 73 so it's like oh wow so we haven't seen like a crazy crazy amount of history yet i know you haven't seen him play you can be as creative as you'd like to be as outlandish as you'd like to be how would you get barry bonds out if you were pitching how would you recommend you get someone like that out at the plate Oh, man and dan did i don't pitch. know it's, it's uh, weird at a very high level yeah i say like change up slow in a way like I, but i don't know what i'd have mm -hmm. to see like his his uh zone whatever the like hot and cold but i, I can't imagine mm -hmm. i'd say yeah just like change ups low in a way is because that's the that's the one thing you're going to at least get him out in front or just something that'll throw off his timing because i feel like he was so good at mm -hmm. just adjusting to like off speed and curveball like he just knew he's like oh curve i'm gonna just like he was just so leagues ahead of everyone so the one thing i'd say or maybe like if you tunnel a sinker slider really well i feel like the answer is you don't get him out like you just kind of like open pred you have your best stuff but my my mm -hmm. whatever the baseline knowledge i think you just have to have something that tunnels well to hopefully, you know, because hitting is really hard. So hopefully get him just a tick off and, and he misses. But like he's probably going to hit the ball. He's not going to strike out. Yeah. Well, walking off the mound was a perfectly acceptable answer. But I really liked yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the uh, last question I got for you is 
You have a really good podcast. You get to talk to big leaguers uh, on more than one occasion. You get to see Barry Bonds across the table right now. What's the first thing you're asking him? I'd, I'd probably ask him, like, what, what was the biggest takeaway he took from, I'd say, what the biggest, no, no, no. I, I, let me restart. I'd ask one that I knew would get views because I, I know people want to know the answer to this one, but also something that I personally want to know. I'd say, if, if you could go back and take steroids again, would you do it and why? I think that'd be a good one because then people are like, oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's a really good question for this whole legacy arc that we've been on to. So I like that uh, you kind of just summed up the whole image of the guy in one question too, which is crazy. So would you allow, how we start this is so important. Do you want me to go first or do you want to go first? I would very much like to go second. Okay. So, wow, this is like, I feel like when B-Rabbit had to go first, I still have to crush it though. Uh, Who's B-Rabbit? Oh, come on, stop. As we talk a lot about legacy, this is kind of the ultimate way to do it, is whether or not there should be a plaque for the guy in Cooperstown. It's kind of the pinnacle of everything, so I'm ready to get down to it if you are. I am. You want to start us off? I know you have some very passionate thoughts about it, as do I. If I had a vote, which I don't, full disclosure, I think I'd use it on yes for the reasons talked about when I, how I don't think the stat should be delegitimized. And there's, there's a lot that's going to go into it. I'm not excusing a single one of the off the field incidents. I do think not being convicted kind of matters. I think that we've, we've have people who've cheated in baseball in the hall of fame. Gaylord Perry has written a book about how he loves to throw spitballs well after they were banned and he's in the hall of fame. I think that wielding, you know, the character clause just for this and just to keep the guy out because you don't like him is misguided, especially because you could be using, we, we could have used that on a lot of people who are in. And I think that I'm also going to kind of have a bone to pick with the system in general a little, which is why are we having this discussion and not doing the inverse, where if we're going to keep a guy who is so clearly an on-field Hall of Famer out because we don't like his personal life, why are we not going to give a guy who's like probably right on the doorstep a little bit of a boost? Like Andrew McCutcheon should be a Hall of Famer to me. I think he's basically already done enough because I also think that we should wield how you are as a if we're gonna do that for the people we're keeping out we should do it for the people that we're almost gonna keep in i hate that it's like oh we only use it very selectively and i think that it's so complicated and there's so many reasons i have that bone to pick i want to drill it into your head i am not excusing anything i think that the steroids is it's like i said last time I think it's moving the goalposts a little bit to punish him for when he started because it wasn't really the standard at the time for all that stuff. So it's something that wasn't even really deemed immoral. So how would he have any idea to be kept out of the Hall of Fame for it? I think that I'm not going to condone any allegations of DV. I think that the perjury case is complicated. It's probably off the books because he's been exonerated for it. It is also not murder. Let's be very clear about that. I'm going to lean yes, but I, I fully understand, agree with parts of, and very much empathize with the no agreement or the no argument. I'm just like running it through my head for this month. I'm coming to the conclusion I would personally say yes. And if you have a problem with that, I'm very open to hearing why, because I'm, it is so complicated and I get it. Seriously. There's my, there's my speech. I guess it's kind of appropriate that after all this time, my answer would be, it's complicated. Um, of course it is, because that's why we're here. It's complicated. That's exactly why we're here. That's exactly why we're five hours deep into this. Um, gun to my head. I'll save that answer for the end. But first, before I make my case, you had mentioned that you don't get a vote, which I was thinking the other day about how people are inducted to the Hall of Fame. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you might know more than I do. Um, the Baseball Writers Association of America has the sole discretion on voting Barry Bonds into the Hall of Fame up until he's ineligible, and then there's a separate committee, which we would probably will touch on later, that could reinstate 
Collins as a Hall of Famer. I can tell you like, right now that he he fared better with the writers who he treated like jerks. Mm -hmm. For yeah. then he went to the, the committee that got Fred McGriff in this past cycle, and they didn't they gave him even less support, like on a percentage basis. Mm -hmm. So we we could just be transparent and say he bullied the media around and there was this very adversarial relationship he wanted to get them they wanted to get him for his whole career and eventually it got to a point where he got more success not enough to get in you have to get 75 percent of the vote to get in from them he did not get that but on a percentage of the vote basis he did better and gr granted it is a way bigger pool of writers than the small committees that try to get other people in like how they got fred mcgriff in which fred mcgriff did fred mcgriff's a guy you can definitely you know sleep at night knowing that he's a hall of famer barry bonds is the one you'll be up probably the rest of your life thinking about because it's just so polarizing and complicated if you have your gung-ho easy ready to fire off opinion that's fine but you probably most likely deliberated it on it for a while before you came to that and Mike, let me jump in because I feel like we're losing course, yeah. we're losing track of where I was. So you don't have a vote. And as somebody who isn't as well versed in this entire Hall of Fame discussion, how Hall of Famers are inducted, especially in a case like this, when media bias could very well be a deciding factor. I mean, Barry Bonds started in 2013 getting 36.2% of the vote. Again, he needs 75. And he essentially increases fairly steadily throughout the 10 years that he's eligible up and through 2022 when he's at 66%. So, you know, a little bit of potential bias, if that's filtered out, maybe that puts Bonds over the edge. I don't know. But the point that I'm trying to make before I actually make my, my case as to whether or not I think he deserves it is that I think personally, a guy like you, a guy like Bailey, are well more qualified to be voting on who is in the Hall of Fame, or at least just as qualified as at least some of these writers who are writing, you know, their ballots, personally. I don't know if you necessarily agree with that, but the point that I'm trying to make is that I don't know necessarily that this is the best system. As somebody who really is just seeing this for the first time, I don't have the solutions. I haven't you know, put thoughts to paper to come up with solutions that might be a remedy for this, but I just don't necessarily believe that this is the best way of doing things. So I do just want to point out there that there are inherent flaws in the system that we have now. Well, thank you for the compliment. We're saying you trust me and someone like Bailey with a vote. I also want to throw Bailey some credit. He also was the first person who planted the seed in my mind when he does his Hall of Fame breakdown videos that, hey, we kind of use the character clause very stupidly. But I think that you touched on it with how people are going to view him. I almost wish I said this as the intro because it's so cool and catchy to me. One of my favorite shows ever is called The Wire. Great show. It's on HBO Max. I can't believe it never won an Emmy. Season five, episode two, they're at an Orioles game trying to, you know, collect stories about how people feel about Orioles opening day. And there's a guy who it's about 2006 at this point is complaining to this reporter about how Barry Bonds and Bud Selig ruined baseball. Uh, all the trust is gone. That's kind of shows you that time does heal all wounds to an extent. I You would think that the further out we get from all this happening like i said this is 2006 it's very emblematic of how people felt about him at the time that there was this big distrust in him in baseball remember like i said when he breaks the home run record we're immediately having the valid the validity discussions and here it's like i think people in our generation i think people like dan i think people slightly older slightly younger for the most part have no issue with barry bonds steroid use I would say the overwhelming majority. It's mostly the people who are adults and live through it and are bigger baseball purists than you and I are, whoever really have a problem with it, especially the, the pre-Balco cutoff of when we kind of decided that this should be, you know, like ethically regulated and had the suspensions in place. Like there's actual consequences. If you do it now, you're kind of going against code back then, different story. But all that is to say, I think that it's funny that we're moving in a direction where I think he's socially more accepted and the court of public opinion is benefiting him, yet it seems like he's less and less likely to be in the Hall of Fame as it passes. I mean, look no further than our peers, other baseball creators. It seems I have yet to find a baseball creator who disagrees that Barry Bonds should be in the Hall of Fame. I don't know if you know I'm anybody, waiting on your take. But, well, I guess that's 
and we'll see if that if that's broken. So, you ready for for mine? As I'll ever be, good sir. Okay, so I think, as was the case for my statistics discussion, I'd like to break this down into several different components. So first of all, of course, there's the on-field play and then the morality with the off-field stuff and some of the on-field stuff, of course, notably steroids. So, as far as how good he was on the field, if you think, if you, I would never use Barry Bonds' personally career statistics as an argument for him to be in the Hall of Fame. If I were to present the case, I would say that pre-steroids, so we're pegging him to be taking steroids regularly at some point around like 1999, 1998. So just looking at baseball reference, from the beginning of his career through the 1998 season, he was already at 411 home runs. This is pre-steroids. 411 home runs, 445 stolen bases. He is the only player, as we mentioned, to be in the 400-400 club. That alone, there are other stats that I can use to support the MVPs too. If you want to disappoint the hardware, well, I'm going to get to that. That alone means he's a Hall of Famer. So if you're going to argue based on stats, you go that way. To me, and just looking at the MVPs, like you said, he won three. He almost won four. Remember his uh, his runner-up finish, and I think 1992, he almost won won four, which would have been the most in MLB history. There are several players who have won three. I'll list them off to you, and maybe you can tell me a common theme. You ready? Is, it the, is the theme that they're Hall of Famers? Exactly. The <laughs> only person who isn't is Alex Rodriguez. That's an entirely different discussion, but everyone and, else who's won Mike three. Trout. Well, and Mike but Trout. Mike but Trout. We're going to hold gonna Mike Trout to a bit of a... He'll, he'll, he'll get there, all things yeah. considered. Mm-hmm. But the point is, and even most of the people that have won two are Hall of Famers. So Barry Bonds won three, almost four pre-steroids. Undoubtedly, this is the easiest part of the debate. Based on that alone, he is a Hall of Famer. So now the question is, if you accept that, the morality of the steroids, right? So the fact that Bud Selig's in the Hall of Fame, somebody who turned a blind eye to all this nonsense, and Barry Bonds isn't, I think constitutes enough of a reason to excuse all the steroids, all the steroid stuff, the morality of that on its own, personally. So about, you're talking like precedent, pretty much, where if we're letting, yeah, you know, the, the top dog in, who is kind of letting it go on his watch, and we're we're effectively deciding that the person who put all that to be can be in the Hall of Fame, but not the people who, like, we're putting the beneficiary of the system, but not the people who actually, you know, mm-hmm. did the playing too. And steroids don't make you hit baseballs; you just happen to probably hit them further and harder. Is the thing, and steroids are also big recovery and career length thing like i remember i heard i believe it was chris rock talk about and it's in the ken burns 10th inning where they talk about it where he says something like if you're a guy and there's a pill that can lengthen your career and have you know family security and all that you're gonna take the pill it's you you almost can't blame the guys in that era pre-society and congress being like you can't do this Mm mm-hmm and like as far as like even off your point about Bud Selig yeah. being the beneficiary, and yet the public, like for example, guy from season five, episode two of The Wire, who holds it against Bud Selig and Barry Bonds, one of those is in the Hall of Fame, the other isn't. The Hall of Fame's own rules states that a player's character is a factor to consider. Of course, um, of course, it's all subjective. One player might have a different impact on a writer's decision than another writer, right? So of course there are some issues there, but. So addressing the, I think, more important part of the moral conundrum right now, uh, something that I addressed before was the DV allegations. So again, this was not something that I knew about before today, and I still haven't had enough time to let it sink in. Because of that, I'm going to phrase it like this. If you don't think Barry Bonds, kind of like you said, if you don't think Barry Bonds should be in the Hall of Fame because of that stuff, you will not see me arguing with you at all. I think that's perfectly reasonable. I think it's things that we have to be you know, concerned about. Uh, statistically speaking, false allegations are rare. So I would not argue that in the slightest. But gun to my head, if I had to tell you whether or not Barry Bonds was a Hall of Famer, I would say yes. See, you did a lot of deliberating. I also did the same thing. You you can understand the no argument. You just can't. It's a lot of like balancing of scales almost. For me, I'd say the biggest two things are the same logic I gave for why I don't think the stat should be illegitimate. Um, I don't want to say that court of public opinion 
should be able to be involved. It, it sucks to have to go about it like that, but if if we're, if that's the game we're going to play legally in this country, legally he is technically a law-abiding citizen. Whether or not you agree with that is, I guess, your prerogative. I almost don't need, there's no way to word this that feels comfortable and that's the whole problem is that you you don't know how to talk about Barry Bonds' Hall of Fame case without almost talking on eggshells unless you're like very definitively yes or no and a lot of people aren't I'd say I wish you could go on the street and just poll do you think Barry Bonds is a Hall of Famer and I wonder how many people who follow baseball would answer in probably a second or two flat. It's probably not that many. Mm. Um, I don't want to cut myself a break or make excuses, but it's... How many more times do I have to say it's complicated? But I think we could say confidently that those who only cite the numbers and say no, obviously, are wrong. Those who cite the steroid stuff... Actually, that, that point is not right. I don't want that in there. Um... You can probably cut the, some of my little ramblings too, because yeah. I, I I'm struggling to articulate why I think everything comes with pun intended an asterisk for for all that well, stuff. I'd like to keep this in there actually, because this is kind of the whole theme of the entire thing that we've made here, right? This stuff deserves all this talking and all this conversation. It's very complicated. It's convoluted. And it's why we dedicated five episodes, on average 40 minutes plus, to each episode discussing about this. I mean, this is kind of the, the entire point of the series. And it almost drains you a little bit to talk about it this much, because you don't know how to feel at a certain point. Because It's defeating almost, right? I wouldn't say defeating. It, it's the, the closer word is exhausting, because you don't know what exactly anything means to an extent and it's a little defeating is where i'd go more like for the fan aspect of like you are entirely powerless to how it he's going to be viewed in baseball it's all on a lot of journalists and suits pretty much for how the rest of his legacy is going to be defined big picture little picture it'll be something like on twitter you open it, it'll be like oh barry, barry bonds was different yeah, of course he was different are you kidding but it's it's such a struggle like after all of this it's crazy how we're here and now it becomes the struggle to articulate everything with him to also build off of this you know us being exhausted argument i truthfully if i didn't have a gun to my head when i had said gun to my head yes i want him in the hall of fame i would just leave the answer with i don't know truthfully only with a gun to my head am i making a decision here that's how on the, it, it, it all depends on what grounds you're arguing. Right? I think it's just a combination of the morality and the and the statistics and his ability, which we know was second to almost none. Of course he gets in on those grounds, but it's just, it is exhausting to talk about this stuff. And I think that's where the entire sport is at right now. So I think this is very much and reflective of where the sport is decade and a half of this like pretty much since since he was an active player we were discussing his legitimacy and whether or not his legacy has been tarnished which i would argue his legacy has been tarnished because there is no plaque and there is you would think that if it's like 1992 93 that this guy would be just viewed very positively unflinchingly for a lot of his career like a lot of these guys even a guy like grady sizemore who granted has similarity scores compared to Barry Bonds for a little bit. There's a video on the channel about that. Like, we look at Grady Sizemore as like, oh, that guy was awesome. If only he put it together. We don't universally look at Barry Bonds like that. We look at him as kind of a jerk sometimes, and that's why it's complicated to have thoughts on him, because you feel bad that there are several abuse allegations in his personal life. You feel bad that this is a guy who is in court for a few different things. You feel bad that even the steroids, while well, I think that for at his time you throw that out being a moral concern, it is something that you point to. And I, the only reason, I, I don't know if I said this last time, if I did, I'm going to repeat the point. The only way I would view steroids as something I'd be inherently against is I hate the idea 
that you could go to a world where whoever has the best prescription wins games. I don't like the idea where it's almost like if you like buy better skins in Fortnite or whatever, if you were to give them competitive advantages, I don't want it to be like that with substances where you're almost paying to win and be paying to be more talented by with artificial substances. That's neither here nor there, but for 1998 or whatever, when we're going to say he started, it's still that point of it's unregulated. It's complicated. Is it really that unfair and of advantage when 15% of the league is estimated to be doing it? But it's enough for a lot of these voters and that's where we're at and most likely where we will be forever. I think what separates Barry Bonds, and maybe this will articulate my feelings on steroids better than I articulated last episode, is that if you had a player who exclusively played in the steroid era, was juiced up, and you know that was his entire career, I think the Hall of Fame conversation for him would be different, I think. Absolutely. Sorry to cut you off, yeah. but absolutely. No, it's okay. And if Barry Bonds wasn't a Hall of Famer pre-steroids, I would say no. Because I have no idea how good he would have been off steroids. It it's a, only fifty. I know fifteen percent is a lot of the league, but only fifteen percent of the league took it. I don't know how he compares to the rest of the league. I don't know what he would have been if he never took steroids. So that's very true. I just want to bounce off that. We are never saying Mark McGuire should be a Hall of Famer. You don't get that discussion. Where Mark McGuire gets to everything he does, even though he has forty nine as a rookie, he never gets to seventy. He never gets to probably even five hundred without performance enhancing substances. He's the flip side of that, where it should... We talked about Maguire and Sosa. They're not in either, and they have even less of a prayer than Bonds does. Maguire has public... Maguire was one of the first to publicly sit down and say he did it. So he almost won... And funny enough, Maguire was also a hitting coach for multiple teams. So it's funny that, that the parallel still exists between these guys, and yet... I would probably bet the farm none of the three ever get in the Hall of Fame, and it's that's kind of all there is to say anymore. And we, we've been going for a little bit about the Hall of Fame, because that's probably the last thing that will ever ha- That's the last domino to fall, and unless he gets, like, a manager's job, a plaque, or passes away, that is probably the end of the discussion. I think Barry Bonds without steroids, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you know better than I do, but at least looking at Hank Aaron's page when I was researching for the last episode, he seems like similar in a way, like a slightly better Hank Aaron. And the best way that I can put it is like Hank Aaron was a better slugger than steroidless Barry Bonds, but steroidless Barry Bonds was a better hitter than Hank Aaron. And a better player, like the, and a better the player. speed defense. Yeah. Barry Bonds like Pirates Barry Bonds, first Giants MVP Barry Bonds, is like the power speed guy with good defense. So, like, if you want to talk five tools, that's a five-tool player. You're, you're bore, a, a comparison is basically left-handed hitting Mike Trout. That's a really good comp, actually. And maybe to bring it back around to episode one, I will read you off maybe our last statistic of the series. So do it for me one last trivia question you ready yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> baseball the... trivia questions yeah i'm ready last one of the series who are the only two players in major league baseball history with 10 seasons or more of 20 plus homers and 20 plus steals barry bonds or willie mays mm-hmm. barry bonds and bobby bonds Wow. Always getting surprised by Bobby Bonds. Yeah, Bobby Bonds was good, man. Bobby Bonds was Listen, good. Listen, I got something I want to say, all right? And then I have something after that, and I'd love to hear it. I want to thank you. I want to thank every single guest that popped in, all of them, and most especially every single person who took time out of their lives to consume this content that we made. A lot of a lot went into this. A lot of, time. A lot of A lot of time, yes. A lot of brain power and work and we we managed to keep a schedule doing this too for releases so we want to thank you guys for making it all worth it for you know consuming it giving us a chance to say what we want to say for all of this whether or not you agreed or not whether or not you even liked it even if you threw it on in the background that's enough thank you guys so much we really do appreciate every last ounce of support that went into this, and I, I couldn't close this out without saying that. 
Before I give my final thank yous and thoughts, I do just want to add one thing. So last year, I released a video called The Barry Bonds You'd Never Heard Of. And as a creator, I don't really get upset anymore. Maybe like the first year that I started doing this, but six years later, I don't really get upset when videos don't do well. But the story of a man by the name of Josh Gibson just really, I really, really liked it. And I really enjoyed telling it. And it's about a player in the Negro Leagues by the name of Josh Gibson, who was unofficially credited from hitting anywhere between 780 and like a thousand home runs throughout his career, barnstorming, playing independent league baseball, and in the Negro Leagues, which is now officially recognized as a member of uh, Major League Baseball's umbrella. So their statistics are now um, integrated with uh, Major League Baseball's. And... Barry Bonds recently, I think maybe as recently as last year, when asked about his home run record, him having the most in history, actually credited Josh Gibson for being the true home run king, which is something we did not talk about last episode. And I just wanted to talk about it because that video, I thought, I really just enjoyed the story. And if you want to see it, I'll leave a card on screen to go watch. But that was the last thing that I've heard about Barry Bonds in the time since. Of course, I would like to say myself, thank you to everyone watching, to the guests, as you mentioned, by name, Ellis Burks, Robbie Hyde, Greg Mamula, Foolish Baseball, Bailey, and that's baseball, Dan Sarmiento, for joining us, for taking the time to, to join us. And for you guys, of course, as Mike said, taking the time to join us. It's been a lot of time that you have spent watching us through this series. And it's been one of the most fun projects that I've ever had the pleasure of taking on in our now six years together doing this thing, man. I really appreciate you having me. It's been the experience of a lifetime. And i um, very, very thankful for you, for our guests, and for everybody watching. This has been an absolute pleasure and a blast. So thank you. And for one final time, thank you all very much for watching. And we'll see you next time. You guys are the best. Seriously, love you. a really terrible joke. I was about to be like, do you think Meg Bassick Sr. was like, when I was your age, I at least got the home run record guy out. Yeah, he was very disappointed in his major league pitching son at giving up a homer to the best hitter ever. Yeah, tough Thanksgiving. Yeah, and the joke didn't even land right there, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my giant fat L here uh, for the rest of our session. Stay humble, pal. <laughs> he was a special advisor to, to the CEO of the Giants 2017. I don't have much info other than that he was that. Let me just see how long he was that for. I have his LinkedIn page right here. That's actually something I wanted to go through with you. You have Barry Bonds' LinkedIn page? I have Barry Bonds' LinkedIn page.